Um, so my name is Graham Clark from UNSW and Emma and I are today are going to be presenting jointly. So for the first half of the talk, I'm going to be talking about um, work we've done in the Antarctic continent and on the South Antarctic Islands. And then Emma's going to come in and talk about some of the other work we do in the lab on different systems, but with techniques that we might be able to apply to Antarctic research within SAFE. Um, so predominantly we study Antarctic benthic biodiversity, which is the organisms living on the sea floor. And we're mainly interested in finding patterns in these organisms um, and discovering what drives these patterns and consequently, what is their vulnerability to climate change. Some of the main drivers we've looked at so far um, around the nearshore environment in Antarctica are light, sedimentation and ice scour. And we've also done some work in the sub-Antarctics um, where communities seem to be driven mostly by exposure to conditions and their biogeography. Um, we're interested in exploring this further within SAFE, so if anyone has interest in the Southern Antarctic, please get in touch. Um, but for the rest of the talk, I'm mostly going to be um, talking about Antarctica and specifically light. So all, all of these um, nearshore drivers are more or less governed by sea ice. Um, and I'll just talk you through one example of this light, which is something that we've focused on in the past few years. So an interesting thing about Antarctica is there's two seasonal cycles going on, um, which affect the amount of light reaching the seabed. We've got the annual expansion and contraction of sea ice. Um, and when sea ice is in place, it essentially blocks sunlight from reaching the seabed. But on top of that, we've also got this seasonal cycle of sunlight. So we've got 24 hours of day sunlight in winter, in summer, 24 hours darkness in winter. Um, so it's not only whether sea ice is present or not that affects the sunlight reaching the seabed, it's also the time of year that it's um, present or absent. So if we look at this x-axis as being um, an annual period, we've got this um, seasonal cycle in sunlight, and typically sea ice forms from late summer, say somewhere around here. If the sea ice was to break out just prior to when it forms, that area of seabed is only going to receive this small bit of light and it's already getting quite dark in the year. But if sea ice breaks out closer to the summer solstice, it's gonna be receiving a lot more sunlight because there's a lot more sunlight coming in per day that time of year. So we've actually got a non-linear relationship between the um, time that sea ice breaks out and the amount of light that an area of seabird is getting in a yearly period. And around um, Antarctic coast, we've got quite a, a gradient of time where the, the sea ice breaks out. So this is a map of around Casey Station. We've got these embayments, which are ice covered for nearly the whole year. And these generally have these beautiful species rich invertebrate dominated communities. Um, further out of the bays, there's a lot more light coming in because the sea ice breaks out weeks or months earlier. And these are generally inhabited by these macroalgal communities. So we were really interested in how sensitive this transition is between these invertebrate and algal communities and whether it could be explained by light via sea ice. So we went and chucked a bunch of um, light meters out around the coast, around Casey, um, collected a lot of data on how much is reaching the seabed each year. And you can see that some sites, these are the ones that break out just before it forms again. They're just receiving a little bit of light all the way down to sites where it's ice free for nearly the whole year round. We then did a bunch of experiments. This is John Runcie who led most of this work. A um, bunch of experiments looking at how much light the algae actually need to survive in a year. Added these two things together and created a model of the number of ice-free days that the algae need to survive based on the time of year where the ice breaks out. So you can see that in the middle of summer, if ice was to break out around here, algae are going to receive their annual light budgets within a few days because the light's so strong that time of year. Whereas if we leave it a little bit later, the amount of days they need rapidly goes up um, to where it goes into this gray area where there's not enough days left in the year. So it's essentially an impossible region of the graph. So the point is that we can go through from a situation where there's plenty of light, but not enough light for algae, um, within a few weeks um, range of the time of the sea ice breakout. And we mapped this to some benthic surveys um, where we deployed these light meters. And we can see that there's a really strong pattern where in this, um, if the sea ice was to break out in these sorts of areas, it's almost entirely invertebrates. Whereas if we go to areas where it breaks out much sooner, it's almost entirely um, algae. So this transition period is, um, in, in ecological terms, it's 
it's a fairly small window in order to switch between these ecosystem states. So what we're um, arguing is that this is actually an ecological tipping point. So these communities can transition from invertebrate to algal dominated states, um, and they're quite sensitive to the timing of the sea ice breakout within a matter of weeks. We've also seen the reverse situation. Um, we were lucky enough to be in Commonwealth Bay a few years ago. This used to be an area of Antarctica which was ice free year round because of strong catabatic winds coming down from the coast of Grand Antarctica. This massive iceberg, BO9B, came along and got grounded here. And ever since then, it's essentially been fast ice year round. So we've gone from the opposite situation where it was ice free year round to now ice covered year round. And what we're seeing is large macroalgal forests currently in the process of dying and most likely transitioning into these invertebrate communities, which we see in other environments around Antarctica. Um, we also modeled where most of this change in light has happened around Antarctica. And as you'd expect, in, in the last um, 30 years or so, it's mainly been around the peninsula, because that's where most of the ice loss has been, and patchy around the rest of Antarctica. But if we look towards the future, simulating further change in light, it looks like most of the change in the peninsula has already happened. And it's going to be more of an issue around East Antarctica um, and other regions. Just quickly mention, we followed this on with a bit of work predicting where these benthic communities would be around Antarctica based on bathymetry and light. Um, so we've created a map of where we think they are. This, is, this shows how many square kilometres there are in habitat per degree longitude, most of it around the peninsula, but also around um, East Antarctica and they it matches up quite well with the surveys. So um, this might be interesting to follow up. If we get to some new places during SAFE, it might be good to see if they, if they match with this model. Um, so at this point, I'll hand over to Emma. Just want to my screen. Thanks, Graham. Just see if I can share my... Can everyone see that? Can you see it, Graham? Yep, got it. Great. So what you, uh, I guess, should know about us is that we are community ecologists uh, and we're somewhat agnostic to the approaches that we take, the methodologies, um, because we're primarily interested in um, community assembly, biodiversity, and how human impacts change that or interact with drivers to change that. And so we tend to work in really big teams. Um, we have big uh, self-assembled teams at the University of New South Wales, and you can see a couple of photos or three photos at the top of people a COVID safe photo um, on your right and uh, we also have lots and lots of collaborators that's just some of our Sydney but Sydney or New South Wales based collaborators at the bottom and lots of industry and government um, relationships so very very happy to work in this big team with the safe group um, hopefully the slide will change it's not changing okay here we go um, I'm just going to briefly talk about our non-Antarctic work so that you get a sense of the other questions and approaches that we're using at the moment or have used recently. And that's really just um, holding out a hand to say, if you want to work with us on any of these areas in the SAFE program, please reach out. Uh, if you wanted to sum up uh, where we're at right at the moment, Graham and I are really thinking about how humans are speeding up ecological systems. Um, and that's primarily through uh, bioinvasion, so increased frequency of probable arrival and, and even range expansion. Uh, disturbance frequency, both physical disturbances and chemical disturbances, <clears throat> and heat disturbances, in fact, more recently. And we're also adding resources to coastal ecosystems. So we're adding heat, we're adding light, we're adding nutrients, feeding near shore productivity. So we're interested in those questions um, more broadly and how they influence biodiversity, evolution, uh, community assembly, etc. Uh, just a really quick run through of some of our experimental work. Uh, we use all approaches, experimental, mensurative, remote sensing. Um, we've been playing a lot with popular pressure. So we've done lots of experimental work looking at what happens when you change the frequency or intensity of arrival of non-Indigenous species. Uh, and an example of this is where we've, we've played with the, the propagule size. So the inoculation frequency here is on the um, x-axis and the invader success, which was the Pacific oyster on the um, y-axis. And you can see as we increased inoculation frequency while keeping the absolute number of invasive species arriving absolutely the same um, and controlling for all sorts of things, including the timing of those arrivals, 
we get increased invader success. And that's what you predict under most of the theoretical models. Uh, we've also shown evidence for temporal variation in the diversity invasibility relationship, that, that very famous one. Um, we first of all showed that it existed um, and changed through time. So three days post arrival of a, an invader, three months and six months, you get very different relationships between species richness and an invader success. But that was actually being driven by our manipulation of physical disturbance um, and the frequency and intensity of that physical disturbance. So this is kind of a model of what we were doing. Um, so if you actually looked at disturbance intensity, you see that the causal relationship is between disturbance intensity, which is simultaneously affecting the biodiversity of these ecosystems and the invasion success. Um, so that was interesting. We work a lot in ecotoxicology. This is my background, but um, a lot in, in toxics, including microplastics and macro debris. A lot of that work is not yet published, but we're very interested in both of those. And we have um, quite a substantial amount of field type experience here. But from a speeding up perspective, it's really the increase in resources such as light in Antarctica, heat um, and nutrients in our coastal systems. And we've done a lot of work teasing out the effects of these enriching contaminants versus the toxic ones. Here's work from seven estuaries on the New South Wales coast and the basics of what we find primarily are that where there's a lot of enrichment, we are getting greater productivity in the um, in systems. We're getting more fish, bigger fish, um, more invertebrates, more cover of invertebrates, um, more soft sediment invertebrates, more plankton, uh, and it's kind of the opposite to what people think, because people think when something is polluted, uh, then there's less life. Um, obviously, what we're seeing also is increased introduced species in those systems. So what we think is happening is we're getting species that are very tolerant to a wide range of environmental conditions occurring in these heavily impacted estuaries, particularly in the locations within those estuaries, which have the most amount of both toxic and enriching compounds. So with all of this speeding up of ecosystems, we're you know, needing to change focus as ecologists. We're needing to use more, more functional rate monitoring and molecular and remote sensing. Um, so here's some of the work that we've used developing biomonitoring tools. It relates to Chris Greening's work, but very much we're using it from a what, how is the community changing perspective and not so much interested in the identity of particular species within those systems. On the left, we've um, contrasted what you could get out of a soft sediment system just from standard morphological approaches to um, sorting them, which is very little in the Australian or Antarctic system, versus what you would get if you just do some simple um, meta barcoding of 18S in this particular case. Um, but we use 16S and 18S primarily. And then we've done experimental work to look at metatranscriptomics and we've used both metagenomics and metatranscriptomics combined. I won't introduce that because it's been beautifully introduced uh, by Chris. But we can see in these soft sedimentary systems when we enrich them, um, substantial changes in metabolic processes such as nitrogen fixation, sulfur metabolism, photosynthesis. Um, and we can pick that up through this combined approach. Uh, it's very effective. Remote sensing is something I think we need to use more of as well. And so you saw some of this work in Graham's talk, uh, but we've also used historical data on water quality in estuaries, 500 estuaries around Australia to, to map out changes in a proxy for water quality um, through this system. So we're open to all approaches and that kind of information feeds into our broader reporting. So I'm the lead author for the State of Environment Report for Australia this time around, which is due at the end of 2021. And Graham is the lead author of the Coast chapter for that report. So those sort of national, um, that's my time up. I'll finish now, but I'll basically say we're also interested in heat um, and we use latitudinal gradients to test those heats, um, those heat theories. A lot of that work is around community assembly. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Graham and Emma.